This is Jill Gittins presenting another special edition of our podcast series. I'd like to welcome back to our studio David Little, homeopath, teacher and author of the Homeopathic Compendium. He's going to join me here today for an interview that I'm sure will be absolutely fascinating. In our last interview, David discussed the evolution of the organon through six levels, which relates to the six editions of the organon. The emphasis of his talk was on case management and posology, that is, the way in which the remedies were prepared and administered to the patient. In this podcast, David is going to talk about the timeline of Hanneman's work as seen through his case books and other writings such as the Materia Medica Pura and the Chronic Diseases. In this discussion, he will highlight the development of the homeopathic Materia Medica and the topic of remedy selection and application. Well, welcome, David. Thanks for being here today. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Now, I would like to say, where does this story, this timeline, begin? Well, when discussing these subjects, I guess you would always have to go back to the beginning, and the beginning is the first organon. In this work, Hahnemann expressed the human being as a whole, as a vital unity in which all powers, sensations, and functions simultaneously affected all parts of the organism, and the role of similars in cure, and the power of individualization. Nevertheless, even in these early years, even going back as far as the medicine of experience in 1805, Hahnemann had spoken about miasms in the sense of some sort of contagion. So although he talked about individuation, he still knew that there were certain group diseases of a fixed character and that these must be paid attention to. So from 1810 in the first organon, Hahnemann moves on to 1816, where he wrote a, a text on venereal disease. And in this text, he spoke about psychosis and syphilis, and began to talk about the itch virus and its suppression. So even in these early years, the formative years, Hahnemann's three miasms, Sora, psychosis, and syphilis were already being reviewed. The same process develops further in 1817 with sources of the common materia medica. In this work, he really speaks about specifics, how in nature there are certain specifics, that, because there are certain diseases that are of a fixed character, and he says, such as a miasm, for example. And he gives the uh, example of miasm, but he mentions four different categories of disease where it is possible that there can be specifics. These are group remedies, group specifics. And by this time, he had already done an acute anamnesis of infectious diseases. And now he was looking at, number one, injuries. He spoke about arnica and injuries that this was somewhat specific from ancient times. People had used that remedy. He spoke about miasms as being of uh, diseases of fixed character and relative stability. Then he spoke about endemic nutritional conditions, such as uh, gouter, for example, being iodine deficient. And he spoke about environmental induced illnesses such as uh, living near swamps or watery uh, terrains. And he spoke of having specifics for these, and he does mention Ramtulia for psychosis and mercury for syphilis. So in these early years, he was already, even though he was stressing individualization and individual diseases, had a category of diseases he was looking at, and it has proved out that injuries are somewhat specific. I mean, arnica works for most uh, falls and contusion. Cantharis for burns. 
these first aid remedies can be relatively fixed to groups. And that's why you have specifics for uncomplicated first aid situations. Going further to the miasms, we understand the group case, which he had already used in 1813, I believe that's the year, on a typhus epidemic. So that brings us up to the point where Hahnemann most definitely is working on individual and the whole, but at the same time, he's thinking about the miasms and other specific conditions. In 1818, Hahnemann introduced sulfur to the Materia Medica. And he was aware of that this was another specific that had been used for a long time against the itch virus, as he called it in the early days. So sulfur was introduced to the Materia Medica Pura long before it appears in the chronic disease. This was around the time of the second organon, which came out in 1819. And in the second organon, Hahnemann specifically talked about driving in the itch, and that suppressing the itch disease, the itch virus, could cause chronic diseases like pathesis, apoplexy, dropsy, insanity, and others. So already at the time of the second organon, Hahnemann was investigating the nature of the mysterious Soric miasm. So after he published the second organon in 1819, what do you find in the corresponding case books from this time? Do they reflect the material he was writing about in the second organon? Yes, they do. In 1821, we have a case book called D22. And in this case book, Hahnemann was noting in the margins of his case uh, records, NB for note well, and writing down things like scab, itch, and other notations to mark that these were caused by Sora. And many of these symptoms that he marked in this way later appear as symptoms within the chronic disease in the part where he does the group anamnesis of Sora where he's expressing the, the symptoms of the soric miasm all the way out to its secondary symptoms, the severe chronic diseases. So in uh, D German casebook D22, Hahnemann is noting down symptoms that he believes are part of the group case of Sora. So from 1822, we know that Hahnemann was doing a massive group study of the soric miasm. Also in this case book, he was using new remedies, new antisoric remedies, which many are, are minerals. And in some of these cases, he could see that his new antisoric remedies were bringing out new symptoms in the patient. For example, he had a patient he gave graphitis to, which immediately caused itching of the private parts. This symptom was marked with NB to note, and later it was found under the remedy graphitis in the chronic diseases. So Hahnemann was collecting symptoms from provings for the chronic remedies, also symptoms brought out on patients. Now some might argue this isn't approving, this is not practicing by the organon, but the truth is that this method is expressed in the later editions of organon, and where it's it suggested that only masters of homeopathy use it, which he was a master. <laughs> so, D22 shows the early group anamnesis of Sora. It shows the early collection of symptoms while testing his new antisoric remedies. And this is in 1821, seven years before he published a chronic disease. Then we come to the third organon. And I often speak of the third organon because the first, second, and third organon are closely related in the same way that the fourth, fifth, and sixth organon are related. And this is the early period of homeopathy. If you're going to split homeopathy into two periods, you could say from the third to the first is the first period, 
from the 4th to the 6th of the second period. And one of the notable lines on this is Hahnemann's approach to the chronic miasms. But also, in the first three editions of the Organon, Samuel Hahnemann had aphorisms which dealt with using alternations, intercurrents, the chief remedy, and in aphorism 270 of the third organon, he wrote the following. When, therefore, a thoroughly suitable specific homeopathic remedy cannot at once be found, on account of the deficiency of medicines whose pure effects have been ascertained, there will usually be one or two next best medicines for the characteristic original symptoms of the disease, one or other of which, according to the morbid state in each case, may be useful as an intercurrent remedy, so that its administration, in alternation with the chief medicine, promotes a recovery much more probably than giving only the chief medicine, most, though still imperfectly, suited amongst all those we possess, two or three times in succession. So we can see, from the first to the third organon, because Hahnemann, basically, he didn't have many remedies. At these times, he's dealing with 50, 60, really very well-proven and well-confirmed remedies, and a, a smattering of others that weren't as well-proven. So, in order to overcome the problem of not having enough proven remedies, Hahnemann used and developed a system of use of the chief remedy and the intercurrent. Now, within the third organon itself and the paradigm of the third organon, Hahnemann was always searching for a single remedy that could do as much as possible, but was sometimes caught in a situation where he couldn't find a remedy that fit the full symptoms. So he would take one side of the case, the majority side of the case is the chief remedy, and uh, the remedy that's coming from a slightly different angle he would take as his intercurrent, often the second most indicated remedy. Now, Hahnemann published the first edition of Chronic Diseases in 1828 and the fourth Organon in 1829, and these were very significant new publications in the development of homeopathy, which you referred to as the watershed years in your commentary. What significant changes did they bring about in Hahnemann's approach? In 1828, Hahnemann stunned the homeopathic community with the release of the chronic disease. For him to talk about syphilis as being two different, uh, venereal diseases being two different diseases, syphilis and psychosis, was already questioned by some. But for him to introduce Sora as this vast, unknown, unrespected, and misunderstood miasm took the homeopathic world by surprise. There were some who immediately took it on and supported it, such as Boeinghausen, while Herring at first was <laughs> confused, but on studying the material himself over time, came to be one of the strongest supporters. So the chronic disease, in the chronic disease, Hahnemann introduced his group anamnesis of Sora and his new anti-Soric remedies, most of which are minerals. Most of which are minerals, to be noted. And then, in the chronic disease, he detailed the treatment of Sora, the treatment of Sora itself. And he said that, in his opinion, seven-eighths of the patients he was seeing suffered from Sora. And he gave instructions on Sora and the use of sulfur and hepersulf as specifics for many of the symptoms of the sort miasm. Now, the fourth organon differs greatly from the third organon. One thing is that the passages on alternation and intercurrence was removed from the main text. 
Hahnemann no longer spoke about the lack of remedies making it necessary to use a chief remedy and alternate that with a secondary remedy or to use a series of remedies. In the fourth organon, he also stressed the wait and watch method, which he also did in the chronic disease. So when you look at the chronic disease and you look at the fourth organon, you find that the wait and watch method was really emphasized with only a few minor exceptions. So I thought at this time I would have uh, Joe read Aphorism 7 of the Fourth Organon because it integrates all of the discoveries that Hahnemann made in the chronic disease period in a nutshell. When a cure is to be performed, the physician must avail himself of all the particulars he can learn both respecting the probable origin of the acute malady and the principal phases of the chronic disease to aid him in the discovery of their fundamental cause, which is commonly due to some chronic miasm. In all researches of this nature, he must take into consideration the apparent state of the physical constitution of the patient, particularly when the affection is chronic, the disposition, occupation, mode of life, habits, social relations, age, and etc. Okay, we can see in this aphorism, aphorism 7 of the fourth organon, that Hahnemann had integrated the idea of the whole and the vital unity into the aphorisms of organon themselves. And this speaks about exciting cause of an acute disease, the fundamental cause of a chronic disease being usually caused by some chronic miasm. And he goes on to speak of the attendant circumstances, which include constitution, character, social relationships, and other uh, environmental influences. So now that the chronic miasms themselves and exciting and fundamental causes and uh, the necessity of studying the attendant circumstances were brought to focus. The chronic disease and the organon were expressing a new level of homeopathy. This is why I called it the watershed years, because at this moment, homeopathy made a great turn. It turned deeply into the study of collective and group diseases. And also, the chronic disease and the fourth organon set the foundation for the next two editions of the organon, being the fifth and the sixth. The sixth organon came out in 1833. And this included instructions on how to treat Sora. And again, in the footnote to the uh, aphorisms 246, he wrote about the need sometimes to use an intercurrent, but there are no references to chief remedy or intercurrent in the main text at all. So he still spoke about alternation and intercurrents, but it no longer was considered a principal tool of the homeopath. It was considered to be a secondary tool, which is very strong and very important. <laughs> All right. So, what you find in the fifth organon is Hahnemann's middle path, the middle way on the dose. And I'm going to repeat this again. First of all, Hahnemann spoke of the middle path because the way he presented posology and case management in the fifth organon was different than any other edition. Here he clearly speaks of a perceptibly progressive and strikingly increasing amelioration being a sign that the dose should be left to act alone. On the other hand, where there was only a slowly progressive amelioration, that the remedy could be repeated at suitable intervals to speed 
the cure. What are these suitable intervals? That varies. His view of suitable intervals for C's and LM's was slightly different. So, he had expressed this middle path because it is the midpoint between the exclusive single dry dose weight and watch method and the mechanical repetition of remedy. You see, these two schools also argue. On the one hand, you have people who say, only use a single remedy and wait and watch till there's a relapse. This is proper classical homeopathy. Then you have others that say and that remedies need to be repeated to be effective on chronic disease. And they argue with each other. No, 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 single dose. No, 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 you need intercurrents. You need, uh, rep you need sequences of remedies. But in truth, in Hahnemann's middle path, these two opposites are united in one way. It's not that you can only use the single doses and never repeat. At the same time, it's not saying you always have to repeat and you should never use a single dose. So once again in Hahnemann, you find that many of the arguments we find in contemporary homeopathy are resolved before they even happen. And if we pay closer attention to what Hahnemann discussed in all these editions of the Organon, in all the phases of homeopathy, we'd realize that so many of these things are coming from different periods. That's why some people say, oh, Hahnemann said this. And some people say, no, no, Hahnemann said that. And they sound like complete opposites. Well, they may be complete opposites because they come at different periods. What he said in the first Organon, some holds true all the way through all the editions of the Organon. Other things have changed. And the situation has changed. So, the most important thing is the middle path posology. Also, Hahnemann did write about the use of sulfur and hypersulf as intercurrents, as an intercurrent with sulfur in the footnote to these aphorisms. And this was very much what, like he wrote in the chronic disease. So the chronic disease in the fifth organon, you'll find the instructions on Sora to be underlined. Now, how are the new methods that Hahnemann outlined in the Fifth Organon, do you see these reflected in the case books from that era? Uh, yes, you do. One of the important things to remember is that Hahnemann was searching for the safest and most gentle, rapid way of cure and was in constantly doing posology and, and dosage experiments. So in D38, which is a German casebook from 1833, the year the Organon was published, the fifth Organon was published, Hahnemann is using almost exclusively all factions of remedies. In fact, it appears that nearly 80% of the prescriptions in D38 are all factions. And Hahnemann spoke about this in the Organon and uh, in... Uh, his preface to uh, Boeinhausen's repertory of antisaurics, how he was using olfaction. And actually, the fifth organon has the most detailed instructions about olfaction and how to give olfaction. You find this in the fifth organon. So Hahnemann was using olfaction for most of his cases. Now, at this time, we have to look back through the case books. We'll note that in D22, back in 1821, Hahnemann was using alternation intercurrents and sequences of remedies. And that these were present in his casebooks. A lot of them were built around sulfur, even at this time, even at these early times. It'd be sulfur in uh, rotation with another of his new anti -sorics in some of these cases, and other sequences. I think I have here in my notes, um, some examples. For example, 
In one case, he first gave placebo, then he gave staphysagria, then he gave sulfur, then he gave stannum, then he gave sulfur. And he had written the sequence out. That's a big sequence. Now, he used sulfur even in D22 more than any other remedy. I think around 1,500 times compared to the second remedy, which was standard, which is only around 300 times. So in this early period where it's matching up with the second and third organon, you definitely see that Hahnemann is, is working with a small amount of remedies and he's trying to get as much out of them as possible. When you go up the timeline to D38, you find olfaction of remedies and placebo. In fact, I believe he gave placebo nearly 15,000 times in that case. Compared to sulfur, which is his most given remedy, which is around 1,400. Now, these numbers are not exact. These are approximates. Because I don't have all of these notes in front of me. So, here we find in D38, at times, Hahnemann writing complex prescriptions. They're still there. They're still there. Not as frequent. Not as, as, as uh, many remedies. As the one I gave an uh, example from uh, D22 in 1821. So, I'll give you an example. In the case of a Mr. Kyle, which is from D38, Hahnemann writes a prescription. He writes seven. Then he writes one, silica. Three, euphrasia. Five, silica. Now here what that means is over a period of seven days, on the first day, the patient should take silica. On the third day, they should take Euphrates, Euphrasia. On the fifth day, they should take silica. So he alternated one dose of Euphrasia in between two doses of silica over a week period. This is an example, and there's other examples. In fact, many of these examples look very similar to some of those prescriptions you see later used by Baron von Boeinhausen. In fact, if you look in lesser writings, you'll find similar form prescriptions, even in 1850. So Boeinhausen reflected a lot of the methods of the fifth organon and uh, D38. Now, what else we find in D38? A lot of placebo. A lot of placebo. After this, Hahnemann moved to Paris with the second wife, Melanie, in 1835. This was the next step. What new developments do we see in the Paris era? Well... Um, I guess it was in 1834 when Melanie first showed up. I'm not totally sure. Do you know, Joe? Okay. Um, and, uh, of course, it caused a big commotion. Here is this young, beautiful, Parisian, French feminist, basically, who rode to Hahnemann's place wearing men's clothes, carrying a dagger. It caused quite a sensation in the little... German town where Hahnemann was living. Some people were aghast, some people were happy for the old man, for he had found love in it, his advanced age. And him and Melanie were married. And right from the start, Melanie had a great interest in homeopathy and the healing arts. And she became an avid disciple of Samuel Hahnemann, and you must say his closest disciple in many ways. Now, 
that they were settled in Paris, Hahnemann began a new set of experiments. The essence of these experiments were that even in D22 from 1821, you find olfaction. They're rare, they're rare, but they're there. He's already testing olfaction. In the chronic disease, he speaks of olfaction of acute intercurrence, where acute diseases interrupt the cure of a chronic disease. And you see olfaction in D38 being 80% of his remedies. Now Hahnemann began to experiment a little deeper with the medicinal solution. In D38, he started giving one pill in it, uh, a, a, a spoonful, this is a German case book, putting a pill in water and stirring the glass, sometimes for five minutes, then 10 minutes, then 15 minutes, as he gave a triple dose. Sometimes finding various amounts of medicinal solutions coming in in D38, especially in the latter part of that year. In fact, the olfaction experiments lighten up and he begins to do more in water, preserved with brandy if necessary. By 1837, he had pretty much perfected that method. In the preface of the 1837 Paris edition of the chronic disease, Hahnemann speaks about using a medicinal solution made in four ounces of water preserved with brandy and giving daily and alternate day doses of uh, spoonfuls. It's also notable that in the case books from this period, which is can be found in DF5 from 1837, you find that he's using a dilution glass. So Hahnemann is already using a medicinal solution spoonful doses, taking a spoonful from his remedy bottle, stirring it into a glass, and giving the patient teaspoons from the glass, spoonfuls from the glass. We also find at this time that he was making small solutions of 500 drops. This is evident in the Valmy case. And using dropper bottles and drop doses into a small amount of water, giving one, two, three spoonfuls of the solution. Now, these posology methods of the medicinal solution made in 8 to 15 tablespoons we find that he was giving his remedies in rapid repetition at times. More rapid than in the past. In 1837, he's, he's, he's using the C potencies. And he's trying to get the most out of the C potencies against chronic miasms. But he's still having difficulties with some of these cases. He wasn't totally satisfied with this. Now, the delivery system of the medicinal solution and the dose glass of the Paris chronic disease is identical to the delivery systems he was using for the LM potencies in the 1840s, particularly in his case books where you see him using a dilution glass. At the same time, we find Hahnemann making experimental potencies, many of which we have no idea what they really were. There were the plus remedies, there were the remedy stacks, where he'd stack numbers like 200, 100, 100, there were the double O remedies, which were given. No one has ever deciphered exactly what these mean, but they were transition potencies that he was experimenting with because he wasn't satisfied with just the C potency. At the same time, he was moving up through the potencies and giving more higher potencies. In fact, we find Hahnemann in his case books using up to the 300, which is a the exact potency he spoke about in the fifth edition of the Organa.
Well, that takes us right up to the 1840s, the last three years of Hanneman's life, when he was already uh, in his mid to late 80s. And yes, even in spite of his advanced age, he seemed to be working very, very hard to perfect his system and to present his most evolved model of homeopathy. Uh, this is the time when he worked on the Ellen Potencies and made his final additions to the Organon, which were eventually, many years later, published as a sixth Organon. What can we learn from his latest methods? Hahnemann's experimental potencies were the bridge from the standard C potency to the LM potency, as far as I can tell. Now, we do get some information from a letter, an eyewitness account by Reverend Evers, where he wrote about observing Hahnemann's experiments, where he was no longer satisfied with making remedies from the drop dose, given... Um, the one drop to 100 drop dilutions of the C potencies. And he began to alter the very potent nature of the potencies themselves. For example, Reverend Evers said instead of using drops, he started using pills. At first, he put like 10 pills in a vial, then filled that up with 100 drops, succussed that. Then he, then he kept lowering the amount, again, lowering the, the, the amount of his pharmaceutical potencies. He started using five pills, four pills, three pills, and it appears that he stayed with two pills for the longest time. The double O remedies. The LM potencies are written down zero by one in this case book in Arabic numbers. But he also had another potency that was zero, zero by one, five, whatever the potency he was using. Now we know that the zero in the LM potency stands for the one pill and that the 1 is the 150,000. So the double zero potency appeared to be a potency that he made with two pills instead of one pill. And he really liked that remedy. That, that was the experimental potency he hung on to the longest. In fact, you see them appear simultaneously with zero one potencies, zero two potencies, zero three potency. And he was testing these two potencies against each other and then at one point, the double zero potency drop out. And Hahnemann is only using the standard C potencies from 3C up to 300C. Now, it is interesting that during all these years, and he continued to do it, he would use his C potencies in the descending potency order. 30, 24, 18... 12, 6, 3. Now, he had favorite potencies within that, but he lowered <laughs> the potency of the remedy when he repeated it. With his higher C potencies, like the 190, 191, 192, 193, 200, he seemed to be raising them. At other times, sometimes lowering them, 100, 95, 90. Then, it appears that these pos posology experiments continued, but he continued to lower his low potencies. It appears to start raising his high potency Cs. And when he comes to the LMs, he makes a serial dilution of 1 to 30 LM potencies. And these... In the beginning, he starts giving them, and he's giving fairly high potencies of them, 7, 8, 9, 10, and, uh, of course, causing more aggravations than he wanted. This caused Hahnemann to change his method down to using the lowest degrees and starting in the lowest degrees. And this is what you see in the final edition of the Organon, which has made some feel that some of the editions were made after he attempted to publish it in 1842. <laughs> so, what do we see in the Paris casebooks that document the LM period? Casebooks like D, DF5 start in 1837, before the LMs appear to be used extensively. 
at all, really. I haven't found one LM potency given in those years. It seems like the LM potency really appears in 1840. It certainly was pressed into clinical activity in 1840. 1841, 1842, and 1843. These LM cases from the 1840s are reflected mostly in Paris case books, DF, 11, 12, 13, 14, although there are little bits in the earlier case books that reach up into the 1840s. But these are cases he started in the 1840s and show his most developed methodology. So the case books from 1840 to 1843 are the capstone of Hahnemann's practice. That pyramid he built from the foundation of the whole, the vital unity, coming upward to the pyramid, going higher and higher in, in his efficiency till he hits the capstone, which is the LM potency, the case of books from the LM time. But he never stopped using the C potency. In fact, he pressed them into use, especially as antisoric remedies, as I discussed in the first part of these podcasts. So for the absorbent remedies, like nux vomica, ignatia, etc., remedies not known to treat the miasmas, he tended to use the lower potency from 30 down to 60. For his chronic cases, he tended to use the LM potency, starting to the lowest degrees, like 1, 2, 3, sometimes 4, even occasionally in the later period, maybe a bit higher. But he no longer gave like 0, 10 first, and, and what he did in, when he first started testing the LM potency. So what do we find Hahnemann doing in his last years? We find him using the C and LM potency side by side. We find him using them by the paradigms presented in the 5th and 6th organon. The middle path that I spoke about earlier. We find his methodology to be very clear. He's still using olfaction, and quite often. His olfaction doses are single doses, followed by at least seven days of placebo. So Hahnemann was still giving single doses, but he was giving them by olfaction. When it came to the medicinal solutions, he tended to give a short series of three to seven doses and have the patient come back in a week. Many times when the patient come back, he would give placebo. Sometimes he'd give another bottle of remedy. But it's rare to find cases in the 1840 Paris case books. Case books in the 1840. It's rare to find Hahnemann giving the remedy daily for very long. One to two weeks. There are a few exceptions to that, but they're truly exceptions. Hahnemann used as much placebo as remedies in many of these cases, or near as much. This is shown in the Reverend Evers case. He used 17 medicinal prescriptions and 16 prescriptions of placebo. He'd give the remedy for 10 days. He'd give the placebo for a week. He'd give the remedy again for a few days. He'd give placebo for we see this in many cases, and when it came to olfaction, these were single doses. So Hahnemann is using single doses by olfaction. He's using short series of remedies, having the patient come back in a week. There's no one that's sent off with a daily dose for a month. In fact, in this period, it's hard to find a case where Hahnemann gave that remedy daily for a month, let alone months and months and months. This is one of the myths that's come out of the sixth organ that Hahnemann gave his doses daily, routinely, mechanically, to everyone who came for months on end. This is because in the organ end, he spoke about giving it for months, if necessary, okay? But if you read the case books, he didn't find many cases where that was necessary. And he employed a lot of placebo. So this brings us a little bit to the second aspect of the Paris case books. Gone are the complex prescriptions. 
You don't see long sequences where Hahnemann would write seven, one, five, you know, one, three, five, or, or, or 14, seven, 14, 21. You didn't find these longer prescriptions. They drop out. Once in a while, he's still using an alternation, usually of an absorc with a uh, miasmic remedy or a chronic remedy. Or sometimes you would find him altering a chronic medicine where there were dual miasms, where the patient suffered from two miasms at once. You see this in the Reverend Everett's, Everett's case, where a, a sore case gets complicated with acquired psychosis, gonorrheal psychosis, and has syphilis in the background. And here we find that he did alternate the thulia and the mercury at different periods. So it's not that there are no alternations and intercurrents in the six organon period, but they're less than were in the D22 from Germany in 1821. They're less than the um, D38 from 1833. And they're less than even in the early period of the Paris case. Hahnemann made only exceptional entries that had more than one remedy, and they usually only had one other. And it was usually either an absorbed remedy because of some acute crisis, or rarely the alternation of two antimiasmic remedies or three antimiasmic remedies which he spoke about, actually, in the chronic disease, and he spoke about it in the organ. So here we are. There are many myths about the six organ. Somehow that Hahnemann practiced completely different in Paris than he ever practiced in all his time in Germany, and that they were secret methods <laughs> that he was using when actually... All these methods show their roots all the way back in 1810, where he, he actually proved remedies in the first Prover's Union in water. He always used a few solutions here or there. He used a dry dose, he used solutions, he used olfaction from early days. Yes, in the early days, Hahnemann wrote in the Organon that it's hard to find a single remedy to cover every case, and that sometimes you have to alternate, and sometimes you have to to use an intercurrent. And if you do this, it would work better than a remedy that was imperfectly fit by itself. But as he got up to the fifth organ, his reasons for alternation and intercurrent became different. Now it was a matter of the miasms. Some of the alternations were around repeatedly giving sore, anti sores like sulfur in order to try to overcome the ancient sora. He would sometimes find that in order to accept the doses of sulfur, he would have to give a dose here or there of Nux Vomica or some other anti soric remedy to calm the patient's vital force and to prepare them to repeat the sulfur. He found that sometimes while you're repeating sulfur, perhaps every week, every two weeks, that you interpolate a dose of Hepersulf and then do this for... Uh, a time period and then go back to the sulfur. This was all found in the fifth organ, in the footnotes. But anything about cheap remedies, intercurrents, alternations, etc., were actually removed from the main body of the text, from the fourth organ, fifth organ, and sixth organ. And so, what else can I say about that? Hahnemann used less remedies in the 1840s than he may have ever used. Now, I know this sounds surprising, but it is uh, what we see in the case books themselves, which is the record. I'm not saying that he didn't use them, but he used them less. So, this brings us to the question, what is classical homeopathy then? 
For this, I'm going to have Jill do a short reading from the compendium, where I deal with this subject in the introduction. In his introduction, David wrote this paragraph. Through my study of Hanneman's public writings, personal letters, eyewitness accounts, and clinical case books, I have been able to document the methods used by the founder on his patients. This includes a wide spectrum of medicinal applications, such as the use of acute remedies, acute intercurrents, acute genus epidemicus remedies, chronic gestalt remedies, chronic intercurrents, chronic anti-miasmatic genus remedies, and prophylactic medicines. Hanneman's clinical praxis included the use of a single remedy given over longer periods of time, the alternation of two remedies, tandem remedies where one remedy is placed before another, intercurrents where one remedy is interpolated with another, trios in which three remedies are rotated, and a sequence of remedies spread out over time. This opens the applications of remedies far beyond what some consider classical homeopathy. How would you define classic itself, the term classic? What does it really mean? David wrote that the term classical homeopathy is commonly used to describe the traditional methods of healing with homeopathic remedies. The term homeopathy means to cure diseases with remedies that produce similar symptoms. The definition of the word classical refers to a well-known standard with a recognized style or form or a set of procedures that follow an accepted pattern. Classical also refers to the period when a tradition of excellence was established, such as ancient Greece or Rome. The term classic is a closely related word which means something made of or belonging to the highest quality or a practice that is reputed to be the best. It also means something that is neat and elegant, especially a traditional style that would last, irrespective of fashion and fans. Non-classical or non-traditional refer to a system that is contemporary and has no roots in time-tested methods recognised for their excellence. Keeping in mind these definitions, it would become apparent that the term classical homeopathy should refer to the philosophy and praxis founded on the classics of the homeopathic healing art. These begin with the organon of the healing arts, the chronic diseases, and the lesser writings of Samuel Hahnemann. The term classical also refers to the medical renaissance carried out by the first generation of homeopaths. This was the time of Samuel Hahnemann, Baron von Bonninghausen, Constantine Herring, and G.H.G. G. Jar. It was these individuals who developed the philosophy, recorded the first provings, wrote the first Materia Medicas, and constructed the first repertories. These teachings were expanded and passed on by generations of practitioners up until modern times. All the methodologies found in these works certainly qualify as being classical in the true sense of the word. Well, this again makes me say, uh, what is classical homeopathy? And we've come to a place where we can see that in Hahnemann there's great unity and diversity. There's a diversity of methodologies that he used over the span of all those years between the 1810 and 1840s, and even a bit before that. All the practices that are in the various editions of the organa are the roots of classical medicine. And they're all valid on their own level. I myself use as few remedies as possible, rarely alternate, don't use intercurrents mechanically, but find sometimes they are of use. With our expanded Materia Medica, where we have maybe 500 well-proven remedies, 
and information on a lot of more remedies, although they may not be that well proven. But we know from those remedies that most of the time one is able to find one remedy that suits the vital unity, the whole, <laughs> of the first organon. So, every, every method is valid in its own paradigm. So there are some out there who use, uh, you know, combination remedies, actually, where they mix one or more remedies together. And my advice to them is, go ahead and try the single remedy in alternation and in concurrence. Break up those combinations and pick the remedy that you think is the most important. See what you think the second most important remedy is. Start to look at it in a different way. And you may find, as Hahnemann found, that using one remedy at a time, the single remedy means to use one remedy at a time, not to use one remedy for the whole course of treatment. Although that's the goal, no doubt. And we all have cases where we've been successful at that. And we've all had cases where we found that was not possible. Maybe there was the perfect remedy for every situation. But maybe not. Because some of these dissimilar complex miasms, the nature of the, the, the complaints are so dissimilar that the same remedy may not be suitable for all phases of the case. But as Hahnemann did, he didn't write down a bunch of chronic remedies in a row in the, in the Paris case books. He only wrote one remedy at a time. In most of those cases, I, I would love to do a statistical study of them all someday, but ours longa vitae brevis. Also, the fifth and sixth organon represent the most evolved level of practice and is the true middle path on single dose and repetition. If you're using the C potencies, they're definitely best used by the paradigm of the fifth organon. The goal is to use as few remedies as possible, but to be open to alternation, intercurrent, or a tandem remedy if and when necessary. So finally, I'd like to say that Samuel Hahnemann passed away on July 2nd, 1843, after three years of experience using the LM potency. I myself have now used the LM potency and uh, the C potencies and medicinal solution by the paradigm of the fifth and sixth organon for over 30 years now. And I still can see and find many, many, many gems in Hannah Hahnemann's writing many hints that, and many, many suggestions that go far beyond what I've even been able to press into action to this date. Every time I read the organ on, I find something new. I'm about to read it again, and I know I'm going to find areas where I may have misunderstood what he said, may have made mistakes in interpretation. Some of my statements on the casebooks may not be right, but I know that it's a a living organon that grows like an organism. The or organon is an organism. It's the same root word. It's like a growing organism that, that multiplies the closer and the more you use it. So, uh, I've really enjoyed being here and discussing these things with you, Jill. I know we discuss them a lot in the back room, and it's... Uh, been a pleasure to do that and share this information with the homeopathic community at large. David, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us, and I'm sure that our listeners have enjoyed sharing your thoughts and experiences as much as I did, and we hope you'll be able to come back and continue to share your thoughts with us on these deeper issues in homeopathy. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Ah, remember the organ is the organon is a living organism that grows on you. The more you